find out if I could write a story that illustrated some of those extraordinary principles that I probably haven't quite grasped. Sometimes I kind of think I grasp it for a minute and then it, it disappears. I mean, I read a brief history of time thinking I'd nearly got it, but now I couldn't tell you what it was about at all. Do you find that the ones that come entirely from your imagination you care more for than the ones which have come through incident and autobiography? No. Actually, I don't. I always worry that, that they don't feel quite as real. Somehow. And the woman in the iron and the radio and have gone is a made-up woman. I mean, she's a kind of fictitious character. There's a lot of others are based on people that I've known or seen or... And I, w I never feel quite so secure that I've, I've made up somebody real. There are stories within your stories, though, aren't there? As well? Yes. There are lots of um, oral stories within the stories. I like stories within stories, like those Russian dolls. Pauline Melville talking about her prize-winning book of short stories, Shapeshifter. It's published by the Women's Press at £12.95. It takes a very good piece of writing in the fantasy genre to keep me reading beyond page 10. It's not an easy area. Bathos and pretentiousness lie in wait for all but the most sure-footed. Mind you, it took fewer than 10 pages for me to be irrevocably hooked on Terry Pratchett and his amazing sub-creation, The Discworld. From the colour of magic via equal rights, mort, sorcery and guards' guards, to name only a few, right up to his latest, Moving Pictures, Pratchett has created a world of supremely logical illogicality, where magic, common sense, heroism and rational cowardice meet. Their fusion creates chaos and a fallout of deadly one-liners. Moving pictures dares bring to your living room two potent myths, Discworld and Hollywood. The edges of his vision went cloudy and there were shapes in the cloud that changed and faded before he had a chance to examine them. Helpless as a fly in an amber flow, as much in control of his destiny as a soap bubble in a hurricane, he leaned down and kissed her. There were more words beyond the ringing in his ears. Why is he doing that? Did I tell him to do that? No one told him to do that. And then I have to muck him out afterwards and let me tell you it's not... Turn that handle! Turn that handle! screamed Dibbler. Now, why is he looking like that? Cool. If you stop turning that handle, you'll never work in this town again. Listen, mister, I happen to belong to the Andleman's Guild. Don't stop! Don't stop! Victor surfaced. The whispering faded to be replaced by the distant boom of the breakers. The real world was back, hot and sharp. The sun pinned to the sky like a medal awarded for being a great day. The girl took a deep breath. I'm... G gosh, I'm terribly sorry, babbled Victor, backing away. I really don't know what happened. It is the alchemists of ankh Morpork who discover the technology of the movies, but they're unaware of the malign influences locked in a mystical area of the Discworld, Holy Wood. Is this illusion more potent than magic, more dangerous? Well, the Hollywood clichés need no explanation, but for those who are coming to Discworld for the first time, perhaps its creator should explain the basics. Terry Pratchett. Well... Physically, it's a flat world, the one that we know in our hearts really exists, which goes through space on the back of four giant elephants which ride on the back of a huge turtle. About a thousand years ago, uh, you couldn't have thrown a brick into Europe without hitting someone that actually believed that that was what the universe was like. And in fact, when I was about 11, I discovered an illustration of the disc world, a, a 16th century woodcut, in fact, in a book of astronomy. And some years ago, when I needed a fantasy world to set my novels on, it just all came back to me, and, and I, you know, I stole it and got away before the alarms went off. How long has been, Discworld been in existence? I think the, the hardback of Colour of Magic, the first book, was published in 1983, but it didn't really take off until early 1985, when that book came out in paperback. And since then... After a, a slightly slow start, as I got up to speed, there have been two every year. I, mean, I never thought, uh, when I did the first books, that I would ever do a book like Moving Pictures, the latest one. I mean, it never had occurred to me that there was that plot there waiting for me. So I don't know what's uh, waiting around the corner for the next book.
Is that a, a well-judged metaphor, the plot sitting there waiting for you, or do you have to sort of search them out? I mean, how does moving pictures fit into the history of Discworld? Oh, well, there isn't a history of Discworld because it's a non-existent place. I mean, I get letters from people that... that, that have, um, someone sent me a disc, a, a concordance of the Discworld with all the places and, and the street names and things, and, and they, in fact, knew more about it than I did because, you know, I have a hero run down a particular street and turn left. And it takes me five seconds to think of a street name for them to turn into, and that's it. But suddenly, you know, in the minds of a lot of uh, readers, now a piece of the disc world has been solidified. If you walk down this street and turn left, you're walking into this street. And, and that's, that's a terrible thought. There is no real history of the disc world, but, but the books more or less follow one another in time. Yes, I mean, we're used to characters like Death, who always speaks in capital letters. Yes, but Death is timeless. He uh, is. Currently, a, a major problem is the lifespan of the average orangutan, because round about the second book, the librarian of Unseen University, which is the, the classical home of high wizardry on the Discworld, was changed into an orangutan, really as an aside, and has since become one of the most popular characters of the series. You know, librarians all over the country write to me about him. And he can only say one word, which is ook, but he seems to play a major part in some of the plots. And he, he was turned into a orangutan in the second book in the series, and I'm now up to about, I don't know, the 10th, 11th, 12th, something like that. Uh, so I have, to, I have to hope that he has a fairly long lifespan. <laughs> he must be getting on a bit by now. As far as moving pictures was concerned, it always struck me that, that, that Hollywood is on the verge of reality in any case. There's something very unreal about the whole of the way the film industry works. And since the disc world is an unreal place, something very, very similar to the whole early Hollywood film industry would fit in very nicely there. And it was fairly easy to come up with, with the, the basic plot. And from then after, it was a lot of fun trying to translate some of the, the clichés of the early Hollywood movies into a fantasy setting. Yeah. You see, on in Colour of Magic, I introduced the, the, the way a, a camera works on Discworld. You have a little demon which peers through a hole in the front and then very, very quickly paints a picture. So all I had to do was update the technology a bit for moving pictures, and they discover that if you use six demons and you wind the picture's path, you actually get moving pictures. You have to use six demons, two of them to paint the pictures, and four of them to blow on the paint to get it dry before the next picture is round past. There are some characters that, that have appeared in this one for the first time, which mm -hmm. are quite fascinating, which I can foresee possible futures for, and that is the trolls. The oh, yes. And the Rocky detritus, and... the troll, yeah. And the I two think... dogs, which I enjoyed very much, Gaspo the Wonder Dog and yes. Daddy. I have to explain, you see, that because it's the disc world, the true Wonder Dog is Gaspo who's a horrible, smelly little mongrel, and because he looks so dreadful, people just don't believe he's a wonder dog. But they do believe Laddie is a wonder dog because he looks like a wonder dog, and he, in fact, he's extremely thick. So Gaspode makes a living as his agent. Every time they feed Laddie, Gaspode is allowed 10% of the food. Woof, said Gaspode irritably. The other dog gave a short, sharp bark and sat up with obedient alertness radiating from every hair. Ah, said Dibbler. And I see we've got our wonder dog. Gaspard's apology for a tail twitched once or twice. Then the truth dawned. He glared at the larger dog, opened his mouth to speak, caught himself just in time, and managed to turn it into a bark. I got the idea the other night when I saw your dog, said Dibbler. I thought, people like animals. Me? I like dogs. Good image, the dog. Saving lives, man's best friend, that kind of stuff. Victor looked at Gaspard's furious expression. Gaspard's quite right, he said. Oh, I expect you think he is, said Dibbler. But you've got that two of them. Alert, handsome animal. And on the other, there's this dust ball with a hangover. I mean, no contest. Am I right? I don't know whether Gaspard will turn up again. Um, you have to be a little bit careful, otherwise, you know, it becomes like neighbours or, or the arches. You have to keep finding things for characters to do. What tends to happen, I think it's, it's like in the best traditions of pantomime, the main characters tend to be fairly cardboard. They have to be. It's like, who cares about Cinderella and the handsome prince? You know who they are. You go, you, go to, you go to the pantomime to, to see Buttons and, and, and to see the Widow Tranky and all the rest of them because they are what give it the flavour. But I did like uh, Victor and Ginger because I could hang so many of the, of the clichés of Hollywood stardom on them. 
You probably don't classify your own writing, but your publishers have put you in the science fantasy genre. Is that all right by you, or do you just write comic novels? I think I have to say I see them as, as comic novels, which is not to say I have anything against the fantasy genre. When I started doing them, I used the clichés of the fantasy world because I was familiar with them. And there are more of them. If I had started off doing, shall we say, a, a, a funny Wild West, I couldn't have kept it up for this number of books. There would be no way I could make the thing work. But one of the things that's enabled me to do the things I'm doing is that people are far more familiar with the clichés of fantasy now than they were, say, 20 or 30 years ago. This was the reason why Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy was such a success back in the 70s, because by the mid-70s, you know, what with Star Trek and 2001 and, and all the films and, and advertising and so forth, people were aware of science fiction and some of, the, some of the backgrounds of science fiction. In the same way, people have become more aware of the backgrounds of fantasy because they've been the Conan movies and, and all the rest of it, and Dungeons and Dragons and all that kind of thing. And so it's, it's just become part of the 20th century landscape. And that means I can then move in and say, hey, you know, you're, you believe this, this and this, or you accept this, this and this about these characters, but have you ever thought about what it's really like? Terry Pratchett. His latest Discworld novel is called Moving Pictures and it's published by Gallants at £12.95. Douglas Adams and Terry Pratchett are often spoken of in the same breath, a breath usually of the baited variety. In terms of popularity and success this is understandable but not in terms of style or content. The Discworld is in a different galaxy from that of the hitchhiker and his guide and from Dirk Gently's holistic detective agency and the long dark tea time of the soul. When I went to see Douglas Adams, it was to find out what books had stocked the mind that conceived the Hitchhiker Quartet, and indeed the meaning of Lyf, a glossary of place names and their true meanings. Lindisfarne, for instance, is descriptive of the smell of an empty biscuit tin. A pulver batch is a potted biography, so I asked Douglas Adams for his pulver batch. Well, in fact, there's a rather sort of eclectic list of things I'm, uh, that I did that's actually in included in my biog, which I, I ought to rewrite by now, because they're mostly jobs that I did, you know, when I was a student, like I was a, a chicken shed cleaner for a brief period, but, uh, you know, not a, obviously not a career chicken shed cleaner. I mean, there isn't much of a career structure there. And uh, a barn builder, which is why you actually see these scars on my arm, because I crashed a tractor so in the process of... Um, building barns. Uh, it was such a serious tractor accident, they actually had to repair the road afterwards as well as me. Um, and um, I was a bodyguard for an Arab royal family, briefly. How have you been able to avoid putting any of these in books? Because <laughs> um, I tend to save them up for interviews. <laughs> <laughs> so when you started writing, were you influenced by what you'd read? I think that inevitably the strongest influence on me as a, as a broadcasting writer at that point was Python, which had been an immense influence on me. I suppose the most obvious other influence would probably be Vonnegut, which is not hard to guess. Oddly enough, one of the strongest influences on my writing was P.G. Woodhouse. And I still maintain that, I mean, not only is he, you know, one of the greatest comedy writers who ever lived, but I actually think he's the greatest musician, if you like, of the English language. There was one passage actually specifically in Restaurant at the End of the Universe, which I think was shortly after I'd discovered Woodhouse. And I very deliberately wrote a, uh, it was just a couple of paragraphs or so that were an out-and-out -out pastiche of Woodhouse. Um, but again, you know, because it was robots and face shifts, nobody noticed. <laughs> you seem to be a great collector of books. I mean, this room is absolutely full of books. Yeah. And you don't just have a Ruth Rendell, you have all the Ruth Rendells. Not just right. one Agatha Christie, but all the Agatha Christie's. <laughs> Are you a compulsive collector in that way? You have to have the whole lot. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, the selection of books here is not so much an indication of what I've actually read, but as uh, the things I'm interested in and the things I intend to read. <laughs> Very often when I suddenly become interested in a subject, I go and buy a dozen books and end up reading one or two of them. What are you reading at the moment? Currently, I'm reading uh, Brazzaville Beach, uh, William Boyd. I and mean, I picked it up particularly because the reviews I read suggested that he was very much concerned in this book with a lot of the things that have particularly interested me in recent years. Um, it hasn't yet engaged me at the level that I'm interested in those things. And there's one other book here I'd like to mention, which is this... A uh, rather severe looking book by a man called Julian James, who's a professor of psychology at uh, Princeton, who wrote the book 
Faulkner's rather snappy title, The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind. It would make a lovely movie title, wouldn't it? You can imagine sort of um, Meryl Streep as the origin of consciousness and Arnold Schwarzenegger as the breakdown of the bicameral mind. <laughs> and um, uh, I don't think it's a book that people over here know very much. I mean, I was introduced to it because I think it's sort of quite a cultish book in the States and various friends of mine recommended it. Um, and it's one of the most extraordinary, mind-stretching books I've ever read. The notion behind it is that um, we know that Homo sapiens has been around for about 40,000 years. His argument is that mankind only achieved consciousness about 3,500 years ago, and that up till then we were operating um, unconsciously. He then demonstrates how powerful the uh, unconscious behavior actually is, and what a, a, an immensely large part of our behavior it still constitutes and that uh, what we call consciousness is actually a very very sketchy thin film on top of what happens in our brain and one of the reasons we don't spot this is that um, when we are not acting consciously we're not conscious of it <laughs> so <laughs> yes um, it all makes sense. Yes. <laughs> so what is the next one that's coming from Douglas Adams himself um, the one I'm working on at the moment much to everybody's surprise, I think, is, is another Hitchhiker's novel. A fifth? Um, a fifth, yes. In fact, I almost like to regard it as the fourth, because I hate, I did not like the fourth Hitchhiker book. And, I, you know, I left Hitchhiker alone for sort of six or seven years, and intended to do so forever. And then I suddenly had an idea uh, a few months ago that really sort of excited me. And I thought, well, how can I make, you know, what context can I make this idea work in? And the only context it would work in was Hitchhiker. So I thought, right, OK, there's a good reason to go back into it. Another Hitchhiker's book on the way. And meanwhile, that was the Bookshelf Presenter's Guide to the Library of Douglas Adams. Now there's a chance for you to join the ranks of Adams and Pratchett as Bookshelf, with the help of publishers Victor Gallantz, launch a competition for a first fantasy novel. Fantasy embraces a variety of approaches. Tolkien, Ursula Le Guin, Mervyn Peake and C.S. Lewis are all fantasy writers. So let's go back to Terry Pratchett and see what fantasy means to him. Listen carefully because he's going to be one of the judges. It's my firm belief that all fiction is fantasy. Certainly all genre fiction is fantasy because it relies on a very specific view of the universe which we know is not one-to-one -one with the real universe. A classic Agatha Christie detective novel despite all we know now about wandering axe murderers and things like that, relies on, on your suspension of disbelief. You're, you're going to accept that one of the eight people in this country house has done this classic murder. It's really like science fiction. You can't really define what science fiction is. Uh, you can point to a book and say this book is science fiction. Something that we tend to fall back on, I think, is the kind of sense of wonder. You read, the, you open the book and you think, gosh, wow, and you, you feel a better person and you feel your ears begin to tingle. But unfortunately, I can get that feeling from a book on paleontology if it's well written and tells me something I didn't know before. I would say to anyone writing fantasy now, you know, I think there is probably a limited market for heroes with swords and, and dark lords in high castles. I think that path has been well and truly trodden. There probably are ways you can make use of that sort of thing. But the classic you know, plot token device of getting the young man you know, across the countryside with a collection of assorted colourful characters he picks up on the way in order to defeat the, the, the wicked king, I think you'll find that people have done that one before. Words of caution from Terry Pratchett. I shall be joining him on the judging panel and so will Faith Brooker, science fiction editor from Galantz. Here are her thoughts on the genre. I think fantasy is a story that can only exist within the mind, whereas a science fiction story is something that's based on a scientific possibility, even though that may be a very remote or improbable one. For instance, if you have a book that involves talking animals, then it's probably a fantasy. But if it's then explained that these animals have been genetically engineered to speak, then what you have is almost definitely a science fiction story. Um, fantasy tends to draw on myths and legends and fairy tales and nursery rhymes. Uh, it may or may not involve magic, but it, it creates a world that can't exist outside the confines of the imagination. Golants are offering a good prize, £4,000 plus publication of the book. Why? We decided that we'd do this prize because we've always been committed to science fiction 
and also the literature of the fantastic, which forms a very important part of our list. Um, and we wanted to show our continued support and also stimulate new interest in the genre. But most important, really, we're looking for to encourage uh, new British writers into the field. So it's a first fantasy novel? That's right. If somebody has been published before but in a different genre, then we will still accept that. Um, but obviously it has to be an original novel, it can't be anything that's been published before. But at the same time it's still open to any of our listeners to sit down and write a fantasy novel and send it in? That's absolutely right, um, as long as they're resident in the UK or Northern Ireland. So where do they have to write to? Not to us? No, to no. <laughs> <laughs> no, write to us, um, Victor Gallant's Limited, 14 Henrietta Street, London, WC2E, 8QJ. And we will send them an entry form. And we won't accept manuscripts without an entry form. And how long have people got? Now they've heard that there's going to be a competition. Have they got time to go away, sit down and write the thing and send it in? Or will it have to be people who've already got a novel sitting away in a drawer? No, I don't think so. The competition will be closing on the 30th of July this year. And that should give them plenty of time to get going. Well, you heard what Faith Brooker said, so once you've written the address, you might as well start on Chapter 1. The rules are all on the entry form, and you can't enter without one, so here's the address again. Fantasy Competition, Victor Gallant's Limited, 14 Henrietta Street, London, WC2E, 8QJ. And if you send anything to us, Zorg Mibron will put it in the disintegrator. Next week, Bookshelf loses weight, sits down and weeps, goes to the music hall, and meets Anita Bruckner. Until then, goodbye. That in four years, ten months, and twenty-seven days, it will be possible to jolt the eccentric planet out of its present orbit permanently. The AVAS had the stunned attention of everyone in the room as a diagram of Rookbat's planets blazed on the screen. They moved slowly around their primary, and the wanderer crossed at an angle to them. Falar gave a weak laugh. <laughs> the dragons of Pern are strong and willing, but I don't think they could move the Red Star. They will not, for to attempt the feat would be to endanger their lives and their riders. But the dragons are able to perform other vital tasks that will allow you to alter that planet's course permanently. It will then be close to the orbit of your fifth planet, far from Rookbat, though, as you now know, the thread swarms still follow it past Pern. Once again, everyone was silent. If that could be done, Ramart asked, why didn't our ancestors do it? The conjunction of the planets was not then auspicious, and by the time these calculations had been made, all had gone north, and this facility was unable to inform its operators. The dragons you have nourished to such size and strength will be critical to the success of the project, if you are willing. The human society depicted has a medieval flavour which tempts us to class the books as fantasy, but Anne McCaffrey asserts that the books are science fiction. So is it important that the scheme for her world should be logically and scientifically based? I tend to go on what you'd call Newtonian sciences, that which is, is prevalent in the world as we know it. And I base my planets on, on that sort of a concept, rather than having a fantasy set of parameters that I figure out ahead of time. All of my stories are based on science that we use here today on Earth. Now, your latest book is called All the Weirs of Pern, but it's part of a series about a, a completely different world. Can you describe that world for us? Well, it's an Earth-type world because it has a, a G-type star, and it's got a higher oxygen content because they don't have any CFFs. Basically, it's a, a rather poor Earth's planet, it doesn't have as many minerals or, or metals as, as Earth would have had in the beginning. Gravity is slightly lighter than Earth, but that makes it easier for the dragons to fly that way. Tell us about these inhabitants, dragons and humans living <coughs> together. Well, the planet was supposed to be an um, agrarian society because the people who were the colonists had just had a major space war and they wanted to get away and give up as much technology as they could and, and operate on a much lower level a level that still allowed them to survive with uh, a fair amount of comfort. But when they got to the planet Pern, about nine years in, they discovered that it had an airborne microorganism which would eat anything organic. So they had to suddenly 
switch in midstream, as it were, and learn how to defend the planet. To do so, they took the genetic material of an indigenous species, which they called fire dragons, and uh, they manipulated this and bioengineered a much larger form with the same capabilities, which resembled dragons. Does your world have antecedents? I mean, is it things that you've read and ideas that have sunk into your mind that you've, you've created, recreated, or did it come... Uh, well, I, I, I literally decided to change the image of dragons from the uh, burn the village, eat the virgin, kill the night type stuff, because I figured, you know, they were intelligent creatures. We might as well put them in a milieu where their intelligence could be of use. And they have telepathic possibilities with you. Well, humans. you can't speak well with a forked tongue, so I had to bypass that. And a mind-to-mind -mind control seemed to be the best way of, of handling the communication. So what's the situation facing the characters in this new book? Trying to survive is what's facing them. And although people have called Pern a medieval society, it's not. It's a survival society. Okay, medieval people had to protect themselves from marauding barons and knights and whatnot. So they built a, a stout defense that everyone could get into. The holds, which are where most of the people on Pern live, are that sort of a, a survival site. But at the beginning of All the Wears of Pern, we have a new character introduced, don't we? The Aivas. Well, uh, yes. I had to introduce a voice address system because my people did not have the technology they required to get rid of thread. So Avos is a remnant of their previous technological expertise, which remained in situ all during the 2,500 years it takes to get to this point in the novels. And he teaches them the technology they need. Uh, not all the technology he possesses. He's very clever about that. He gives them a start on the road to using technology again. Mind you, they had a lot of it, but the records that they had had become uh, distorted or basic pieces of information had dropped out due to mildew or whatever. So they really had to start almost from scratch to learn enough to get rid of these threads. But up to now, your planet Pern has been a fairly green in the modern sense, a non-violent world. Is Avas in danger of changing all that? No, definitely not, because he had his priorities from the people who uh, programmed his system, and it was a non-violent system. Arthur Clarke and I are perhaps unusual in that we don't need a war on our planets to tell a good story. Mm -hmm. Does your, your world of dragon riders and craftsmen, craftswomen, deal with themes that are relevant to the reader, or, or is the series just meant as a delight for the imagination? No, I think I solve problems that people are facing. At least I get letters from fans saying that uh, my books have helped them through hard times and helped them to understand certain problems that they themselves were facing. Uh, human nature is, is universal. We're going to find the same sorts of problems no matter where we are. Anne McCaffrey, the latest in her Dragon series, is All the Weirs of Pern, published by Bantam at £13.99. Last January, we exhorted you to dig out that novel, or to stick a blank sheet in your typewriter and begin the novel that you'd always meant to write, and to enter the Bookshelf Glance First Fantasy Novel Competition. Hundreds of you did. Terry Pratchett, creator of the Discworld novels, and Mary Gentle, whose books include Golden Witchbreed and Ancient Lights, joined me on the judging panel along with Faith Brooker from Glance. Together, we travelled through some extraordinary landscapes and peoples. The winning book will be published in summer, a perhaps undreamt of success for its author. How successful was the competition as a whole? Faith Brooker. I think it was a great success. I wanted to get the point over that we are now publishing a lot more fantasy than we used to do um, in Victor Gallant's. Science fiction has always been uh, one of our most important areas and uh, fantasy is now a big burgeoning part of the market and we wanted to really go into it in a big way. And secondly, I really wanted to get a response from all those people out there who want to write fantasy, new writers, encourage them and see what they, they were capable of. And in fact, they, uh, they responded very, very well indeed. Well, they did. There were more than 500 entries. So what were you looking for during the very first stages of the judging? I think uh, we were looking for something that told a story, was original, uh, something that grasped you uh, straight from the start. A lot of people fell at the first hurdle because you could tell basically that the plot was not going anywhere. If you really don't want to read past page 30, then there's not much point. 
Well, what criteria do we use in judging fantasy as distinct from other sorts of novel? Mary? I think it has to be that it will have a third dimension to it. It will have the third dimension of the exotic, which will make it fantasy, that paradoxically will actually make it a great deal more like real life. Terry, what do you look for? Well, maybe this was the long thing to do, but what I was looking for at the start was saying, let's assume I've bought this in paperback and it's worth £3.99. Have I got value for money? So I found myself looking initially at things which perhaps were not to do with, with fantasy. Have I lost track of a character because their name is very similar to another character? Has there been a, a mighty leap in the plot which has left me a bit bewildered? Uh, in other words, the qualities that you would look for in any well-written novel, because I think a good fantasy novel has got to, has got to be judged twice. Is it actually a good novel anyway? And then, is it a good fantasy novel? It's perhaps a, a harder thing to do. Generally, what were the weaknesses that eliminated some of the contenders, Terry? I suppose the biggest one was that they had not written what I would think of as a whole book. There were some superb uh, plot ideas, some interesting themes, interesting characters, perhaps some interesting writing. But then you step back and look at it as a whole and say, does this make a complete book as it stands? I think of, the, uh, of all the ones I read, I wanted to read through to the end, but uh, one or two of them left me a bit disappointed. Mary, were you a bit disappointed with some of them? I think so, yeah. I, th I think that the main difficulty I had was finding people writing not in their own individual voice, but obviously in the voice of their favourite writers, and sometimes in the voice of several of their favourite writers, which is spoils your enjoyment oh. somewhat. What was it then that distinguished the final six that we chose for the, the long list from the others? I was looking for some kind of edge. It's very hard to say exactly what that was. And it was the ones that, that, um, the ones that, that just engaged my interest because I thought they were finding a new spin or a new twist or, or just were taking a fresh look. It, it was a shame in the case of some books that were a real romp and really enjoyable to read that you'd have to point to it and say, well, look, he can't actually plot or they can't actually do dialogue. And you, you feel that, you know, were we perhaps not to have this book, but the, the writer's next book, then those flaws wouldn't be there. Mm. Sounds as if we're all rather sorry we had to have one winner. Do you agree with that, Faith? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. Even um, just going down to the sixth shortlist, there were other people who did uh, come up with some lovely, uh, perhaps, ideas, or they wrote really beautifully. And so there are. it was a kind of um, an exercise in throwing up some more raw talent. And so we're still sifting through a few of those manuscripts which actually didn't even reach the shortlist and we will be contacting people who have um, entered the competition. What qualities do you think there were that distinguished the winner? Mary? I think I'd have to describe the winner as not being entirely a novel form. It was very good on character and in the sense that it was almost a biography of a, pit of a particular character who is really not a very nice person and the writer doesn't cheat and doesn't soften the edges mm. And you get to spend an, in, an entire book in the company of this rake's progress, which is very, actually very refreshing. Do you find that refreshing, yes, Terry? Yes, exactly the same thing. I, was, I kept expecting that... You know, I, I kept seeing ahead of me a certain <coughs> story shape which said at some point uh, this particular guy is going to be redeemed and is going to change. And no, this guy just goes on getting worse and worse, but in quite interesting ways. And... Maybe it's a kind of, maybe on that basis, it's a connoisseur's book because, you know, the, the, the novel shape you're expecting because you're being lazy doesn't actually happen. And that, that, was, that was, you know, made it interesting for me. Faith, what qualities for you distinguished the winner? I like the way um, he carried the whole thing right the way through. The narrative drive was extremely strong. It had an old-fashioned feel to it, an epic kind of feel to it. And he, his background of, of the world in which this character is involved is quite different from our world, and he evoked that quite cleverly um, with very few strokes. He actually yeah. managed to portray that world without hitting you over the head with great wadges of exposition as to why that world was the way it was. Also, I would agree that the main character was very compelling, even though he was utterly dislikable. Um, and I think that's quite a clever thing to do, too.
Well then, let's go and find out who did win. Beam me across to the annual fantasy convention at the Ramada Inn and we'll discover who the winner is. The BBC, I suppose, as a whole is well known for its patronage of the arts, but it's uh, slightly unusual and gratifying that a single programme such as Bookshelf that's throughout its life explored and investigated and explained the book should now be responsible for putting a new book on the shelf. I'm not sure quite how other judges go about their judging. I suppose some may sit around a green baize table with sandwiches, Perrier water and wine. With fantasy it's slightly different. You can teleport yourself into the future, have a look and see which title's selling best, come back and publish it. I only wish it were quite as easy as that. But the judges talked long and hard. We came up with six on the final shortlist, which were Merlin the Last Trump by Colin Webber, The Province of the Goddess by Lucy Dixon, The Knight of the Rose by Mark Leyland, Red Adam by Nick Black, Sentinel by Paul Tozer, and A Dangerous Energy by John Whitbourne. And the winners are as follows. First of all, the two runners-up are Colin Webber for Merlin and the Last Trump, and Mary will present his prize. Second runner-up for Red Adam is Nick Black. And the winner of the bookshelf, Gallant's first fantasy novel, is John Whitbourne with A Dangerous Energy. It originally came from that one... Um, image that just occurred to me out, completely out of the blue of a magician sitting in a tavern or something like that, but in, in Victorian dress and I thought how could it come about and really the premise of the book is an alternative history where the Reformation was unsuccessful and accordingly the novel set in the, the present day but uh, it's te as we would regard it as technologically retarded uh, socially perhaps not so and it's, it's not um, a novel that is critical of um, Catholicism as such but it, it has led to a very different world in the present day. Has winning this prize fired you to take your writing even more seriously? I mean, what are you going to do next? I uh, certainly will keep, keep on writing. I, I will have always kept on writing, whether I was successful or not. But it, it's very nice to be been told by someone else that my writing is, is of some quality. So it's given me that extra boost of confidence so I shall write. Plus, that, that little more um, enthusiasm in the future. So you're going to go home tonight and start the next Absolutely, time? yes. The minute I get home. John Whitbourne, winner of the Bookshelf Glance First Fantasy Competition. Next week, John Julius Norwich brings us under the spell of Byzantium. Anthony Burgess looks back on his first novel, and a few others look forward to theirs. Until then, I think I'll take the quick way back to Yorkshire. Goodbye. Bookshelf was presented by Nigel Ford. The readers were Tara Dominic and Gerard Green, Music was by Symbiosis, with special effects by Clive Williamson. The flautist was John Hackett. The bookshelf was produced by Sally.